right. Well, my name is Michael Alden. We are here in Blue Vase Studios. I'm super, super excited for my next guest. My next guest is the host of the All Out Show on Sirius XM Satellite Radio, the Shade 45 channel, Eminem's channel. His name is Rude Angelini, also known as Rude Judy. He's also the author of two national best-selling books, his first book, Hyena, and his second book, Hummingbird. It's, they've been described as dark, deviant, and deliriously funny, but they're also, you know, pretty vulnerable and also pretty raw. It'll make you make you laugh. It might even make you cry. And it also is going to make you think. And he's here today. We're going to talk about his books. But, you know, I've been following this guy for a while, and I'm really, really interested, you know, from a business perspective of what he's done in his career, how he's built his career. His background is wild. And some of the things that he talks about in his books, really, really eye-opening. Rude, thanks for being my guest. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Well, uh, I, re- again, I really appreciate it. I know you're super busy. I know your book just came out, um, Hummingbird. Um, you know, so I, I first heard about you. I know you probably you might even be tired of talking about this part, but I first heard about you. On, I'm a big fan of Howard Stern, of course, and, uh, you know, he played the classic, you know, kind of uh, match between you and, and Floyd Mayweather, uh, you know, when you're on, on your show. And um, tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of your background, though, and how you, how you, how you started. I and mean, we grew up and kind of how you, you know, kind of how you really became an entity. I got put on by going on Jenny Jones, which for young people, is, it, it's like trash TV, daytime talk. Uh, I think the closest thing that out right now to it is, uh, you know, like a Maury Povich, Jerry Springer. Right. Jenny Jones specialized more in the makeover shows and shit like that. Right. And I just, I I went on as as a gag. My homegirl, I had two friends, two ladies. They sent in before and after pictures. Like, I used to be ugly, now I'm pretty. Unfortunately, one got uh, rejected. So my homegirl was like, I don't know if I want to go there by myself. And I told her, I was like, yo, I'll go with you. We'll just say that I made fun of you. And uh, I get a free uh, free trip to Chicago. And I'd been, you know, I'd been getting in a bunch of trouble growing up. So I'd been on probation for the last five years. I hadn't been able to leave Michigan. So... To me, it was just, I just wanted to kind of go on a vacation. I wanted right. to get the fuck out the, I just wanted to get out of Michigan, get out of my little town. Went on there one time as the bad guy, and uh, it, was all, it was almost like everything that I did growing up prepared me for that moment. Uh, what me and my friends would do was just make fun of each other all the time, constantly. We, we worked kitchen jobs, we hung out on the you know, we hung out on the porch, we hung out at the crib, we hung out at the basketball court, and we would just talk shit to one another. And I grew up, uh, this, this was a group of black kids. I grew up around, I grew up in a pretty um, integrated neighborhood. Sure. And, uh, and um, I, I was often like the token white guy in these situations. And, you know, I, I would get rolled for that shit. But, we were it, we were just it was post racial you know like they would crack white jokes on me I crack black jokes on them because we were all from the gutter it didn't matter it didn't matter we were all like broke as fuck uh, there was no pretense <laughs> like you know they 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 talk shit about my nose uh, or me <laughs> the lack of me having an ass because I don't have an ass I got a white person ass and uh, you know and I'll be like damn and you look like you know fuck you jumping. You jump into a pool, look like a fucking oil spill. You know, like it, it, it didn't fucking matter. So, I go on Jenny Jones, and I didn't know how to act. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't understand this politically correct shit. I didn't. I didn't. I had. I lacked white guilt, uh, and it was like me versus hood ass audience, and I got them. Like they couldn't get me. I got them, and it, people didn't know what to do with that. They responded. They're like, "Damn, this motherfucker's raw." <laughs> Yeah, in your in your book, you, you tell you tell the story about you know, like you said earlier, that it that that you know your whole life was kind of prepared you for that moment when you got on the Jenny Jones show. But an interesting part uh, in your book, uh, Hyena, you talked about is you know even though you grew up dirt poor, I mean you got great. I mean I thought I grew up poor man, but you grew, like it's like it's I mean this. I want to talk to you about a whole bunch of stories, but the very moment though, when you decided that you were going to go on Jenny Jones, even though you grew up dirt, dirt poor, you did grow up in a, uh, your, your family, your mother was fairly religious, right? Um, or, uh, no, no, she was a hippie, a hippie. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> but she didn't want you to go on that show, but, but you decided to go anyway. That moment is a kind of a pivotal moment in your life, right? 
Well, yeah, and that that to the other point that prepared me for that. You know what? I didn't have a lot of my parents loved me, right? I, I they loved me. They just they were going through their own shit, and I didn't get a ton of support. I I, I was out I, I was left out there hanging a lot of times. Uh, they were they were just dealing with their own shit, and because I had a lack of support from my parents it gave me a freedom to do what I wanted to do. A lot of people, you know, their parents take care of them. They look out for them. They nurture them. That's all great. Uh, they pay their phone bill. They make sure they they pay their college. But suddenly, now they got to say, and what the fuck you do, you know? Oh, you're going to do that? Oh, you, like, my parents can never have that conversation with me. Right. You know what I mean? Like, they ain't do shit for you. Like, you know, they, they were there for me, but, like, I was on my own very early. Uh, what the fuck were they gonna tell me? Don't go, go don't do that. No, right. fuck you. I'm doing that. I love you, but like, no, I'm doing this. Like, you're not stopping me. And everybody thought I was stupid. Everybody thought I was crazy. We were poor, but we didn't identify as white trash, even though other people identified us as white trash. There was just certain things we did culturally that didn't perpetuate poverty. Like, uh, we read books. We went to the library. We these are all free things, too, by the way. Yep. Um, we went to museums on free fucking days. We were curious. We we had a broad taste of music. We had a broad taste in music. We were cultured. We we're broke, but we were cultured. And uh, so my parents was understandably they're like, "What the fuck are you doing?" And you know, the divor- <laughs> they're divorced. They're like, "What are you doing, man? Don't do this." And I was like, "No, I'm doing it." And it turned out it was that that was this pivotal point that changed my life. Like I went from, I was just, I was a window cleaner. If you look at the early, the early shit, it's like window cleaner. Uh, you know, in, in, it says, uh, West Bloomfield, which, which is a rich neighborhood. It says like on Jenny Jones is like window cleaner, West Bloomfield, but it wasn't even like one. I didn't even live in West Bloomfield Two, It was, I had been living in my grandparents' house cause I got evicted because they said I was selling drugs out of my house, and I wasn't. Um, I was selling drugs from other places, but not out of my house, you know what I mean? Uh, I get on my little bicycle and go drop shit off, but I never have anybody come to the crib. And and that's, you know, like, that's kind of, that's, wh- that's where I was at. I was like a window cleaner, like, my parents moved away when I was 17. So me and my sister were kind of like paying our own rent and going, going to going to high school and stuff. And we, I was doing okay for myself and then went through some bad times and I ended up staying with my grandparents. Uh, and it was just trying to get back on my feet. So you get on and the show. That's when Jenny Jones came. So you get on the, I mean, the Jenny Jones show was huge. You know, same thing, you know, like Ricky Lake, Jer, you know, Jerry Springer, Maury Povich. I mean, Jenny Jones was, was, a, was a huge show. You get on the show. I've watched a bunch of your clips, and they, they are pretty hysterical. Uh, and you and you have this, you know, again, when, when I read your stories about being poor, I mean, the, the most recent one, the most recent story that you told in the book. And by the way, um, I can't wait to talk about the book, but. I mean, you tell stories where, you know, your, your mom saves up $60 to bring you to the dentist because, uh, you know, that, you know, it took her a long time to do that. And you guys d- didn't have dental care. You get to the dentist and you're sitting in the chair and they tell you to leave because you didn't have enough money. And therefore, the tooth that you had to, you know, the toothache and the uh, the stuff that was going on with you, you just had to kind of deal with it. So, I mean, just the way you, again, I, I think I, I, I always feel as though that I grew up tough, man, but that, that's fucking brutal. But so you get on this Jenny Jones show, you have this certain level of, you know, fame, so to speak. And, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of cool. But, but then from there, like you said, you're doing things. You were a bathroom attendant at a, was it a, was it a, a strip club or something? Tell me. A gay bar. Tell me that. No, t- t- tell us that story. Well, it was just, uh, Johnny Jones and Peck shit. Right. It was, they kind of understood what they had with me. Uh, I, and I think I think people I think uh, you know and I people can relate to this. It's like uh, fairness and power is based on leverage. You know what I mean? Like whoever's got the leverage decides what's going to be fair, right? Uh, and I'm like, you know, in their eyes, 
I'm just some fucking, I'm, you know, I'm some trash kid that is in the middle of fucking some Rust Belt state. And yeah, I spiked their, I spiked their ratings. I was spiking their ratings by a million, a million people. I and I'd get paid three hundred dollars cash to do the show. Wow, because that's what they paid. Right. So that doesn't, that's that's not sustainable. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't, or you can't like sustain a. a and and it wasn't steady either, so I had to go get these other shit jobs. But but I never felt like I was too good to do anything. That's the part I don't right, understand. That, that's the part I don't want to cut you off, but that's the part that I love about. You can just te- I mean, you talk about this in your story, and I think a lot of people. And this is the part that I'm. It starts uh, get me gets me really excited about the business side of it. Is you did have this certain level of quote fame. Everyone else probably from the outside thought you were you know making millions or whatever whatever thought. But but you were doing whatever it took to to live right and to and to continue to to move forward and and that to me like where did you, did you learn that from your parents or, or was it something that you just just i don't know man was where, where did you learn that kind of instinct well my you know i'm second generation immigrant so my new my grand my italian grandfather is a fucking you know he's he's a, he's a monster like he did he was a beast and his and his father to save up to bring him over was uh was he worked in the coal mines at 12 you know right so like there's there's a bit i think i think there's a bit of hustler in all of us for the most part like if you tap into it if you look deep enough on your family tree that you should be able to find some fucking hustler in you my mom is a hard ass worker uh but my mom is a my mom never wanted the responsibility of being a boss, so she's she is more of a worker bee. Uh, and I got to see I got to see like, all right, man, uh, she works really hard for a little. I want to work really hard for more. I'm I. The other thing that made me work hard is insecurity. I was uh, the, growing up. Poor. And look, and here's the deal: like um, other people had it worse than me. Other people had it better. This is, this it's all on a spectrum. You know what I mean? Like, I, right? I ain't had it the worst. I had both my parents were around. That was that was a plus. Sure. You know, they, so so like, you just, you just play the hand you're dealt. And what I did was like I was so fucking paranoid about being broke. Yep. That I would grind at anything and you find whatever angle you can i always say like I, to me like rules are for fucking suckers i'll play I, you know, if i'm playing backgammon i don't cheat uh, if i you know and i don't do anything um that i find immoral but my moral code is different than what laws are so i'm just hustling any fucking way i i, I just hustled any way i could do it like fuck the law yeah, like you, you could legally own a person a while ago. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> Law and morality is two different. You know what I mean? Like so, I I think um, I just I just hustled very hard to escape a situation that I felt very vulnerable in. The, those those stories about going to the dentist and I, dude, I still have a hole in my fucking mouth where that like. I got I just threw my tongue there. Like I still got a fucking hole in my mouth where that tooth needed to be fixed. Right. Uh, do you do I'm you feel as though do you, do you feel as though you know you know and I kind of feel this way and I like how you describe the different spectrum. I say the same thing. I grew up tough, but you know, growing up on the south side of Chicago or Compton or something like that is is way worse than you know than 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 the way I grew up. Do you feel as though now? Where you're at today, and you and and I'm, it's you know your career is awesome, and I'm sure it's going to continue to get better. But where you're at, to, do you feel as though that that almost looking back on it, it was an advantage against those kids that did grow up in the in the in the you know the 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 suburbs and the nicer areas that had kind of you know everything. I feel like it's almost well, like a an unfair advantage. I don't know. Like I don't. Here's the deal, man. Fuck that. I just fuck thinking about that. Like I. If you're thinking about what the next man has, you're not thinking about what you need to do to get it. Right. Like, I don't care. I don't care who has an advantage. Right. I, I, like, I can look and say, okay, man, he's got he's got a leg up. He went to that school. He knows those people. His dad knew that guy. He can get in over there. Um, 
yeah, sure. What, yeah, that's fine. He he might have an advantage, or maybe I have an advantage that that I have a harder work ethic than that dude because their parents coddled him his whole entire life. Uh, and what what will he do without them? And maybe in the back of his brain, he doesn't have the confidence that I have because I know that I can get it no matter what. Um, but to me, it, it, that is it doesn't matter. Like what matters to me is fucking what I'm what I'm trying to do. Right. And what I'm what I'm trying to do is create cool things. Uh, try. My goal was to. I was like, I want to get paid to be myself. That was my goal. I was like, I want to get paid to be myself, and I've been able to accomplish that. You know, you sacrifice things, you bust ass. Uh, I, like right now, I'm and I'm talking. I'm doing three podcasts a day. Right. Like I don't give a fuck. Like, and and some are some are tiny, others are big. It doesn't fucking matter. It's like you got to put in the work. Right. Yeah. No. I, crazy. And, I agree. I mean, you're right. It's it's you know you got you you got to do then, it. good. And then you got to like work smarter too. Like these young kids, they understand the internet way better than I do. Like, you know, they can work. They can work less hard and leverage it better because they are more intelligent when it comes to manipulating the internet than I am because I'm an old motherfucker and it's and I'm it's newer to me than it is to them <laughs> this is true I feel the same way uh, in a second right? I, I want to talk to you in a second I want to talk to you specifically about hyena um, how you got to that why you decided to start writing the book uh, in just a second folks if you're listening and you're watching right now we're on with Jude Angelini also known as Rude Jude he's the host of the All Out Show on Sirius XM Shade 45 you can hear him uh, every day from 4 to 7 p.m. Um, his both of his books are amazing Hyena and Hummingbird if you want some more information about Jude you can just go to hummingbirdbook.com he's on Instagram we were just talking about the, uh, the internet world he's at, um, at One More Jude Snapchat Rude Jude Twitter Rude underscore Jude. By the way, um, I was uh, hounding him on Snapchat because I love his Snapchat. It's just this real kind of inside look in this voyeuristic world that we live in of what his life is like, and it, uh, it's pretty cool. So you know, check him out. Pick up his books. They're available yeah. everywhere. Uh, books a million. Uh, uh, at, uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. He, uh, you, uh, you recently posted a picture of uh, your book next to Maya Angelou's book, which is really cool. Um, so your first book, Hyena. Uh, what? What made you decide that you were going to put this in a book, write the book, and how did you, you know, how did you, because a lot of people, you always hear this, a lot of people want to write a book, and they all say, oh, I got a book in me, or I, can, I want to write a book, and, you know, what made you sit down and say, okay, yeah, I, I think I got some cool stories in here, I think there's something that people will like, people will buy, what, what, when you sat down and decided to write the book, tell us about that process. Well, first start off with the blog, my homeboy was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta I was complaining about, I was complaining about my job. Right. I was feeling a bit stag. I was feeling a bit stagnant at work. I felt underappreciated. I didn't understand really how the system works. Um, and and basically, you know, uh, I think uh, at Sirius you are rewarded more for if you do things outside of Sirius than if you're successful inside of Sirius. It's just it's this weird. It's 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 like this. It's weird, you know what I mean? It's like, yo, it it doesn't matter if you have more people listening. If I have more people listening to me than a celebrity station, that celebrity station's gonna get paid more because they're a fucking celebrity, right? And I, it it took me like five years to figure that shit out. I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter how hard I grind over here if I'm not making a name for myself outside. And I was complaining about it. My buddy was like, well, why don't you fucking do something about it? I'm like oh, okay, so he's like, you got a platform to a blog, so I started doing a blog, and you know, I'm writing lists and putting up wacky pictures. I actually started on Tumblr of all places, which has become like the haven for the fucking alt left right. bitch made motherfuckers, <laughs> um, fucking perpetually hurt and offended. Uh, so like, I'm writing this shit on fucking Tumblr of all places, uh, like damn near ten years ago, and. I start writing funny sex stories because I'm always like I'm promiscuous and uh, wild, wild shit happens when you're promiscuous. You know, you just open yourself up to more opportunities, and people are responding. And then I was starting going through a breakup 
with my my ex who I write about in the book and uh people were like that's not funny write something funny and that shit pissed me off I was like what bitch like fuck you I'll write what the fuck I want and I, and it, it dawned on me it's like I'm giving this away for free and I'm giving it away on a platform a blog which undervalues it like it just you you gotta you know you d- delivery systems you know if packaging means a lot how, sure. you, how it's delivered means a fucking lot so I'm like I'm cheapening my fucking work by not charging and putting it on fucking Tumblr so I took everything down and then that's when I was like I'm gonna write a book but it started it was one step at a time it was like first off it, it was I'm gonna write every day then it was like I'm gonna write a book then it was like I'm gonna edit the book these are then then I, I, I didn't have the confidence in my writing because I'm I'm self-taught I didn't go to college I was in fucking stupid people English class because I didn't try and um and so I was I was extremely insecure about my writing, so I did not want to take it to a company uh, like a publisher and be rejected. That was going to shatter me. I knew it. I knew, right. I knew it. If I brought it somewhere and I got rejected, that was going to really fuck me up. And I didn't want to do that. So I was like, I'm going to put this book out on my own. Then I was like, but that doesn't mean anything. Like, so what? You write a book. Now sell the book. So it was like one step at a time. And then the book ended up getting optioned by HBO, which it never, you know, nothing ever came with that, but it was a good cosign. Uh, it got picked up by Simon and Schuster, another good cosign. And the funny thing was, is like I made a, it was a tactical move. Like I was making more money self publishing, but I was willing to sacrifice the money to get the cosign by Simon and Schuster that I was an author. To help build that like legitimacy factor, right? I mean, I mean yes. that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. I, I'm I'm the same way. My my first book was the same thing. I was like, you know what? If I can get a real publisher, you know, it means something. Even though you could probably make more money. Uh, yeah, from, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know what your deal was, but like the standard deal is like a dollar thirteen or a dollar thirty per book. They're selling them for sixteen bucks a piece, and right. you get a dollar off of that shit. Right, like it just doesn't even make sense. I was able to charge my fans less and make more by doing it on uh, Create Space, right. but you don't you you don't get to put author next to your name because you're not being co-signed by the system. You know what I mean? Right. Like so, you take that pay cut and do it, uh, and that's kind of that's what brought me to that's what brought me to finishing the book like it's 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 almost like yo dude sit down and write some shit that's gonna get picked up by hbo i would have i would have been paralyzed right like you just and the other thing about the book is i'm kind of a control freak so that there's only i i know i can control whether i write and i can control what goes in something and i can control what i put out on my own like no one's telling me what to do and there's no compromise. I get to do it all on my own and I control my own destiny. There's been so many times where you get, especially in show business, man, like there's so many, there's so many things that have to go right for it to be, for something to be a success for you that I just, I didn't want to depend on that. Also, you know, one other thing is like, I, and you know, I've, I've gone over this before. I know how I'm viewed. I get. I understand how I'm viewed. I think it's important that people understand how others view them. Sure. Uh, for good and for bad. And at 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 my worst, look. Uh, and I don't call myself this, but this is what I've been called. I'm. I was a fucking wigger. That came from trash TV. Right. I and when I came out to Hollywood to try to get on, it was apparent they wanted nothing to do with me. Like I was spiking the ratings by a million, but I couldn't get a fucking meeting out here. And I, and when I when I finally got the job on, and, and yo, look, and some of it was my own fault. Like I get an audition, and everything that made me good at Jenny Jones talking shit and being loud and brash, fucking, I would burn bridges in in meetings and shit like that because I was just too hood. <laughs> um, really, I, like looking back, and and there was, and I had no one to guide me. You know what I mean? Like there's people that take some money out of my pocket, but no one to really guide me, and I didn't understand. 
I had to learn. I learned it the hard way, but I learned. So I'm like, okay, you you go for, like for instance, before I I went from Jenny Jones, you know, and then when I got when I got the job at Sirius, I was washing dishes, at washing dishes and uh, preparing food at, at a raw foods place. Right. Like, I, like, so I was like, all right, man, you go from you go from Wigger on trash TV to Wigger fucking shock jock to you know. Uh, want to be uh all of that shit and to me they don't get respect i didn't feel like i was being respected so so they're like who gets respect people write books they get yeah. to go to colleges and talk and shit like that you know like authors get respect so i said i need some i need i need i need a bit more respect so the book wasn't about the book wasn't about uh selfishly it was uh, to be used as a key to open doors to get into other places unselfishly it was it was i I wanted to provide a voice to a whole group of people that have had been kind of ignored and then when they were fucking when they are looked at they're fetishized or demonized and i just want to humanize that experience that i had yeah you know your stories when you talk about you know being kind of you know somewhat self-conscious uh I mean, you, you tell stories that that are beyond vulnerable. Uh, again, it's been described as dark, deviant, and also, you know, again, delir- deliriously funny. Read on read on uh, on Amazon, but uh. there's stories that you tell about your life. Uh, some people, again, from the outside, be like, "Man, this guy is is fucked up, man." You know, um, when you when you put down the stories in your book about the things that you've done from a societal standpoint, look like they're just totally just whacked out. Do you find that, or did you find uh, that it, it was somewhat cathartic? It's almost like therapy for you to say, "Hey, you know what? This, like you said, this is who I am. This is how I grew up, and you know, it's just, it's real. This is yeah. me." And, uh, the, and like I remember one of the problems with the HBO thing. Like I, there's, the, uh, it was like. Uh, you know, I was I was writing about a relationship uh, conversation I had with my father, where he's like drive drop me off at my mom's house, and he's trying to have this birds and bees talk with me, and he's talking about how he used to eat my mom's ass, <laughs> and that was that was just that was any other like this that, and they were like, this is you know, trying to be shocking, and I and it was. I'm obviously I didn't do it right because I'm like no dude I'm not trying to be shocking I'm trying to show you what my normal is right I'm, I'm trying to show you what my normal is and there's a lot of people whose normal is like that who deal who are over sexualized as children and then that becomes their fucking normal like I don't understand like I don't understand squares like that shit fucking I'm like whoa dude that's fucking being a square is weird to me you dig so it's like and, and I'm not there to judge them right I'm just saying like yo this is how I've been conditioned this is this is where this is I feel more comfortable in this than in another way. But when you and put I, it when yeah. you put it in print though, and you look at it and try and be objective about it, I don't know if you tried to do that, but you probably did, and say to yourself, "Man, I'm about to hit send, so to speak, in the whole world." I mean, you had your your inner circle, and then you had some people that I know that you talked a lot about this type of stuff on the All Out Show and some other interviews. But as soon as you hit send, man, it's there forever. And, and did you? Did oh, that you, was the hardest shit. Right, You're right. Yeah, writing it was easy. Hit and send was fucking terrifying. Right. Uh, writing it was easy. Hitting send was terrifying. And and I'll take it one step further. If you're writing autobiographical shit, and you're not fucking terrified when you're dropping it, maybe you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Right. Because I was fucking and I and and I, you think I was scared. For hyena, I was petrified for hummingbird. Right. Because I, to me, I got even more dark and more vulnerable, vulnerable, and uh, you know, and I've even had like some of my homies critique it, like, "Oh man, so you know, it's, you know, it's pretty bleak." I'm like, "Yeah, that's my brain, dude. Like, what do you want? <laughs> like, sorry, like that's uh, there's. I think it's funny too, but like, yeah, yeah, it's darker, bro. Like, what do you want? Like, this is life. This is my life, and I'm talking about stuff that needs to be addressed." Yeah, let's talk a little bit about you know when you you know you talk about things that that need to be addressed and you know you are obviously open about it in both of your books. 
You don't really drink, uh, but you've done every drug. In, in fact, drugs I've never even heard of, uh, and drugs you never even heard of. You, you, you've tried, um, and you, you said in, in, in hyena that you know that there's a void uh, in your brain or in just in your consciousness, and that's maybe re- reason why you know you, you've done or, or do drugs. Um, when you when you talk about the things that you've done in your life, uh, have you found that people have reached out to you and said, "Man, I you know." I relate to that, or, or I get that, and also the yeah. addic- the addiction side of it. Though it seems as though you have, it seems as it's a, it's a weird thing because I, I lost a brother, and I've, and my mother's HIV positive, and I, you know, I've, I've, drugs have been around my whole life as well, and I just I've never done any, and and I and I'm reading, and I'm thinking to myself, man, you're gonna have this faction of people that be like, this guy is glorifying drugs and doing drugs, right? And then you're gonna have this other group of people that says, all right, well, I get where he's coming from, and and then and then. You know, you've you've almost seemed to be like this aberration where you're not quote really like addicted, right? But you're you, because, but yet you're you're still doing these things that you know shouldn't be good for you. I, I don't even know if there's a question in there, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Like I just, it's just and like, I think I, I think the way you laid it out is that is it perfectly. This is it's this complicated thing, right? Like I'm just telling you what happened. Telling so in in yet yeah, true. I also antique. I decided not to write about antique. You know, I decided to write about this. So one could argue that all right, man, you're glorifying it here. But it's also I'm aware of my audience, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm aware of my audience. Right. The 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 thing is the other thing is this is like yo, dude. I'm. I think we have, I'm like, uh, you know, I got that libertarian lean, man. Like, yo, dude, you want to fucking kill yourself on drugs? That's, it's your life. Right. You, you don't want to wear a seatbelt and you want to go flying through the fucking window? It's your fucking life to lose. Right. Uh, as long as you're not, as long as you're not fucking with me, man, we're golden. Right. Like, we're fucking, we're golden. I'm not here to save the world. Like, I think, in a, so... That's when I'm writing about this shit. I'm like, yeah, this is what I do. And some people take it like, it's crazy. Some people are like, yeah, man, you got me wanting to do K. And I'm like, I'm reading, like, the book I read, I was like, whoa, you, this makes you want to do the fucking K? Like, I'm over here spun out of my fucking mind, clearly addicted, uh, in some, mentally at least, uh, having a hell of a time relating with the world, and it makes you want to do it. All right, like I can, I can, I put it down. I can't control uh, how someone's gonna take it. And then other people, like you know, other people that are going through that addiction, they're like, "Yo, dude, I can relate to that, man. Like, I understand that feeling." And I think a ton of people feel that void. And that's kind of like what, that's the point. It's a human thing. Like, it's human to feel an emptiness inside you right. for a lot of people. And some people overwork. Some people go you know, dump themselves into religion. Other people buy a bunch of shit to fill that hole. Other people try to fuck their way through the hole. Um, shit, and I do a, a little bit of everything. You know, some people <laughs> overeat, you know. Uh, it's, so it's just like I'm kind of showing you, I'm a, I'm addressing the hole and showing you what I do to deal with the fucking hole. And I'm also trying to show these causal things throughout my life that perhaps maybe this, these are some of the things that, that, uh, have, have turned me into the man that I am. When I was writing hyena, I, in my, in my brain, it was how to make a monster. And I don't know if people, I never said it out loud, but like, I just wanted to show how to make a monster. What do you mean by that? Like that's, many people would look at me as anti-social. Yeah. Like, not not as in, like, uh, shy or choosing not to hang out with people, but, like, the behavior I do is, m- goes against what we as a country stand for. I'm highly promiscuous. I fucking do tons of fucking drugs. I don't give a fuck. I do whatever. And it's frowned upon. But the weird part, the weird part about that though, those statements is the last part you said you don't give a fuck. Is that you have to though, right? Because I mean, to, 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 I mean, I know you said you've, I mean, like all of us, have 
fucked things up and done the wrong things and, and took meetings and said the wrong thing. We, we've all done that and stuff. But but you're you know you're at where you're at today. You're on a you're on a you know you're you know you have this great platform on a on a huge with a huge corporation. Um, you, you know you've you've you know when people talk about the grind, you've really done the grind and you continue to do the grind every day. So you you do care to a certain extent. And so that you're 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 spot on. Yeah, you're right. Right. Yeah, you're right. And so that's so, what I wanted to ask you this this question about. Okay, so hyena. It, I guess it's a calculated not giving a fuck. Right. You know what I mean? Like you don't care it's about what other people think. But I think we all do at the end of the day. Right. I, I think it's foolish to say you don't care what other people think. I do care what other people think. I, I think I want to be understood. Sure. Um, uh, is, is it annoyed? Am I annoyed when I'm not? Yes. Am I annoyed when I'm dismissed? Yes. Of of course I do care. And I think, you know, I, I'm not I'm not Jesus or Buddha where I can be like, oh, I don't give a fuck what people think. I'm not there yet. I don't know if I'll ever get there. So clearly I want people, clearly I care what people think. But it's all, it's, it was, the, I guess the not giving a fuck is at times I um, knowingly do things that are self-destructive just because. And, at, and in the moment, I won't even know why. And I'll, I just have to see it through. Sure. When you hit when you hit that send button on hyena and now hummingbird, um, and you know talking about being terrified, for me as I'm thinking about it, you know you're you know Sirius XM, did it scare the shit out of you that they would just be like you know we're done with this guy? I mean he's fucking no. whacked out. Really? Did you have no. a conversation with no them way. before that or? No. I wasn't. I wasn't worried about that. One, everything I talk about, I do. Fun. You know, we talk right. about that wild shit on air. Right. Two, the show's successful. Right. Three, it doesn't affect my job. I show up to work. Right. You know what I mean? Like, they're gonna fire me for that. <laughs> you know. You know, they're gonna fire me for what? Writing about what I talk about. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so that <laughs> that's that's true. Now I think about your show. Like, I just thought about that question. I'm like, you know what? That's that was actually a pretty dumb question. Now <laughs> some of the well, shit. No. It's, it, <laughs> And and yo know, and, and not to hit too hard on that making a monster. I don't view myself as a monster, but to some people I am. And that's and that was kinda what like I don't yeah, I think I'm a good person. Like I can look at myself in the mirror every single day. And I'm fucking I'm actually uh you know I'm I'm like one of the most least likely people to fuck you over. You know, like I'm voted most le- least likely to fuck you, you know, like yeah, yeah, no, I get it. I so, get it. Yeah. I don't, I don't feel bad for what I do at all. I don't, I don't apologize for shit. Like, and if you, and if you're doing some shit, you feel bad about. Maybe you should fucking stop. <laughs> that's that, that's some great advice. Look, man, I know, like you said, you got a couple other uh, podcasts. You're super busy. You got your show and stuff. Um, you know, is there anything? Well, is there anything you want? As long as you need, man. Oh, oh all right, good. All right, another, all right, good. All right, so for another uh, half hour. So all right, you got me. look. look. Like I'm saying, yo, bro, I'm at your disposal. I appreciate you, and I appreciate your listeners. Like, I really do. Like, I'm just trying to spread the word and get to as many places as I can. All right, I want to, talk, I want to ask you this question then, because this is something that when I um, – the, the moment <clears throat> with your first book, you know, as an author, right? So, um, w- you know, so, okay, great. Congratulations, you wrote a book. Good for you. Uh, congratulations, you got to publish a uh, book. Good for you. Then it's like, all right, well, let's make some lists. Uh, and you tell the story and it like hit me like a dagger because uh, I'm chasing that New York Times uh, with with my books. And, you know, your sister calls you and says, hey, you made the New York Times. Tell us that story and what and what happened. Man, shit. So, you know, here's and you, you, you know what it is writing a book and you know how fucking hard that is. And you know how hard it is to sell a book. Uh and mine, mine was especially hard because, like, I'm trying to sell a book to half of my audience. Half of my audience is, is like yourself, and then the other half is, you know, like, uh, they haven't bought a book in 15 years or ever. So, like, you're trying to sell something that people don't want. Uh, so it's it been this uphill battle, just not even, just getting people in, excited about about it and I've been pushing 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 trying to get on that New York Times bestseller because New York Times bestseller means acceptance right by the mainstream on my own terms 
you know what I mean? Like not accepting, not changing myself and having people like, like you, it's like acceptance on my own terms. And I'm, you know, busting ass, trying so hard and I keep missing it by like, you know, like it, the first, the first week it could have gone and they sold out of books in fucking three days. And like, it breaks your heart. Like how, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to get up on New York Times bestseller list when you don't have enough books to sell? How many books was that? And it was, fuck, I think I got like 27,000, like, and that's not, not 2,700, excuse me. Okay. Right. That's, that's, that's what a low number that's, it, the entrance onto that list isn't as crazy as one thinks because no one buys fucking books. You know, right. the top, the top is very heavy, right. and then you get further down that list, and it's pretty fucking light. You right. know, like because people aren't buying books like they used to. Uh, so, like, and every every week I was I was doing well, but I just kept missing by fucking you know. 500 200 300 we missing my mark and and it was slowing down and then finally my sister was like she calls me up i'm driving down melrose you know i, I mean it's, it's exhausting selling this shit right and she was like i don't know if she texted me and i think it was a text and she's like jude you make the best seller list and bro i started crying like i I'm, I'm about to cry thinking about it because I know because because I've been working so hard not just at this book but since I was young you know like I've been working so hard for so long and really pushing and really trying uh you know and I, like it was like I finally made it and then uh I called her up. I was like, I, I made the list. You saw it. She was like, no, I heard from a girl that talks shit. Like, I'm like, you heard from a girl. Fuck. And, and you know, the girl's full of shit. And I was like, Rachel, don't. That's my sister's name. I'm like, Rach, man, like, don't, th please don't ever do me like that. Like, you broke my heart. Like, it fucking killed me. It crushed yeah. me. I was, and you know, you shake it off, you shake it off, but I was, I was good in a quarter mile, but fuck dude, like, oh wait, it just dashed your dreams on fucking the rocks of reality, as they say, my shit was just fucking like, nope, still ain't get it. And I never did get that New York Times bestseller. I feel that and pain, And I don't know man. if I'll get it with this. Yeah, I, I, I feel What's that, that pain. What's that like for you, man? Like, I, so I tell you, so it's funny with that. Sometimes I feel like um, just like, and I'm, you know, I'm a super positive guy and I always have been. I, sometimes I feel like just the world is working against you and you just got, like, you know, I had, I don't know if you know Les Brown is, he's a motivational speaker, like a Tony Robbins type guy. And he said, you know, he said to me something that was really profound. He says, it's the struggle that creates life. And I'm like, yeah, but it's always so fucking hard, man. And you work so hard. And, and so my first book. I was naive and I didn't really understand the numbers. And you know, I hit number two on Wall. I hit number two on Wall Street Journal, fifty-four in USA. To oh yeah, dude, fifty two on Wall Street Journal, fifty-four Locking in USA eight. Today. And um, and, and and I'm like, there's no way I'm not gonna hit the New York Times. And the New York Times list comes out, and I didn't hit the New York Times. And then my second book was with a big, a bigger publisher, Wiley and Sons, they're the fifth largest publisher in the world. And uh, they, they, you know, so we're, I mean, we're crushing it. I was like number one in everything, in every category imaginable, on every, you know, Barnes and Noble, uh, Books a Million, everything. Yeah. Right? And uh, they, so then the New York Times called my publisher and ordered two copies of the book, and they said, "Look, look, we don't want to get your hopes up, but they never do that unless they put you on the list." And then uh, USA Today came out, and um, and I was I was lower than I was in my previous two books. Uh, and I was like, fuck, I just knew right then and there that there's no way I was going to hit the New York times. And you know, the, here's the other thing, man, I tell you, we, we could even talk offline about this. Like I've learned so much because I've written four now, including a children's book. And you know, there's a huge ed editorial discretion, right? You, you know, you could sell a uh, hundred thousand copies week one and still not make the list. Um, because New York Times isn't just numbers. It's a curated list. And, you know, and, but, you know, but you look at guys. So when I read your book and some people would say, well, there's no way the New York Times would put that type of book on, but that's not true. Because if you look at, um, 
uh, uh, Tucker Max's book, uh, Assholes, Finish for, uh, Assholes Finish First, and I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. I mean, uh, very similar type of style and the stuff. And he was, you know, I think number one, you know, New York Times bestseller. So, um, yeah, but Tucker and I are Tucker and I are from two different places. Right? No, definitely two different places. Yeah, but know, but he mean he Tucker's Tucker's a, a lawyer writing about yeah. doing <laughs> yeah, yeah. lawyer things. There's yeah. a there's a class there's a class distinction there. You know, there just is. No, I agree. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not putting you guys in the same category. I was just trying yeah, to think about, you know, the. I guess, I guess that's. And he was, yo, Tucker's a marketing genius. Like yeah. his marketing was out of control. Yep. He really understood how to do it. He really, he was like, oh, gee, he was like one of the. He trolled his way to it, and he got there. And I don't fucking. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna troll anybody to buy my book, man. I'm not trying to fucking. Uh, you know, I'm not going to send my shit out to women's groups and try to get them to, to fucking ban it so that people will talk about it and be interested. Like, either fucking buy it or don't. You know, like, dude, I saw that one. I saw that one video that you posted. I think it was on uh, Snapchat. Uh, again, folks, just real quick, uh, we're on with Ruju Jude Angelini. He's the uh, host of the All Out Show on Sirius XM Shade 45. You can hear him weekdays from four to seven. He's the author of Hyena and his latest book, Hummingbird. Both great books, a lot of fun. It's gonna make you think. It's gonna, it might make you. It's definitely gonna make you laugh. It might make you cry. Um, it's definitely, um, you know, entertaining, uh, and it's raw. I mean, it's a, it's a real life story about a guy that you know that that grew up with nothing and and where he is today. It's it's a really interesting read. So if you want some more information, uh, you can go to hummingbirdbook.com. You can find Jude at at uh, on Instagram. It's uh, one more Jude, Snapchat, Rude Jude, and Twitter, Rude underscore, Rude underscore Jude on Snap. Oh, I'm sorry. Root underscore Jude on Snapchat, yeah. and then uh, on Twitter, it's also Root underscore Jude. Yeah, I saw that picture you posted. I think it was on um, on Snapchat, or it might have been on Instagram. And you were, uh, you know, I love by the way the the printer. I think is also in Michigan, where you're from. Uh, you're yep. in you're in there. You were signing. You, there was there were pallets of books. How many books did you sign? Because I I've signed a lot of That's books, but I was like, holy shit, six, he signed he signed a lot of books. Six thousand. <laughs> oh six thousand fucking books, bro. It was. I forgot how to write my name by the end of it. Uh, like it was crazy, and it was like that was another surreal moment watching your shit on, um, on, on the conveyor belt. You know, like coming off, being, yeah, coming being, off the printing line. Yeah, yeah, yeah come, coming off that printing press thing. It was just, it was really fucking. You know, it's it. It was. Uh, it was surreal, like. It's been an emotional. It's been an emotional uh, ride, you know. Like, it's, it's doing shit is hard. Like just do, six, six, being successful is fucking hard, right? Uh, and it's it, and like it, it's almost like you can't you you can't take your fucking foot off the gas, but it grinds you down. So it, it's like it's. It it's it's been it's been a crazy journey. Like and, yo, and like and here's the ill shit with that New York Times bestseller man. Like they the the wildest shit is what you see. What you see too is you can be number one in all these like a lot of these motherfuckers. They pay these people to buy the books in strategic places. The drop thirty you know thirty grand investing, and then they go do the fucking the book tour and pimp the system. Like it's there's a way around that shit all the fucking time. I just really wanted to get on the right way. You know what I mean? Like I wanted sure. to get and two. I didn't have an. You know, I don't got fucking thirty grand to drop by my own fucking book. You right. know, like I just don't have that. I don't have that kind of money uh, just to be throwing around it. What do I do? I have a stack of thirty thousand dollars worth of books in my fucking room. Like <laughs> it's embarrassing. Like I met that guy with all his own book in the garage, but. Yo, there's there's a way to pimp every fucking system, and New York Times is no goddamn different. So, like, cats read that list, and, you know, uh, you know it's bullshit. I know it's fucking bullshit, but everybody else doesn't know it's bullshit. Therefore, you want that list. You know, like that's the fucking craziness about it. Right. It's, tell me, tell me about um, since we're talking about the actual publishing world. So you self publish. How does how does the Simon and Schuster deal happen? D- did they come to you? Did you did you get an agent? Because yeah. a, a lot of people want to know how that works. Well, Simon Schuster approached me. I was doing pretty well. I was uh, it, it, here's the business side. Like this, you just gotta like figure out how to work the system. So, like when I when I dropped the book, it was all, I when I self published. I made it so it was only available on Amazon. And by doing that, I didn't dilute the market. So I, 
meaning you couldn't go to Barnes and Noble and get it. You had to go to Amazon. And get right. It. I made it where it wasn't available in Kindle. So therefore, now you have to buy it as, as a hardcover or as a paperback. And there, I had it for a couple of reasons. One, I like the art of the book. I think it, there's an art to the book. I like that. I, 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 I like something that's tactile. And, I, and, I, and we live in a society where everybody gets everything right now immediately. And they consume it and they throw it away. And I wanted, it was just too much of my life for somebody to fucking, I don't need your dollar that much. Like, I need you to consume it in the way I want you to consume it. And that is by ordering it, waiting, holding it, reading it. And in doing so, I stumbled upon this thing that, like, I was able to compete with these major books, major books, because there was only one place to get it. And that was on Amazon. So Amazon, the the whole for the for the two months I was out, I was always top three hundred. I peaked at thirty three, uh, and that's like I'm going up against fucking Deepak Chopra and Harry all Potter, these other motherfuckers. Yeah, I'm going up. Yeah, I'm going up against fucking monsters. But by 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 making only one channel to get it, I was able to fucking work the system. The other thing that I did, I would take it down. Every time, every time there was a mistake in the book, and this is something I just stumbled upon. You know, there was a mistake in the book. Uh, I'd have to fix something. I had an ex-girlfriend tell me to get her name out the fucking book. I changed her name. I would change this color of the spine, and I would rename it. And what I found was people were buying the same book, over and over again. So I'd sell seven copies of the same book to one person because they were collecting them like sneakers. Oh, wow. And it was just, so I started doing, I started following the fucking, the, 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 the sneaker model where you create fucking, uh, scarcity. That's what people value in, in this world right now. You can have anything. Yo, dude, I'll got, I'll hop on Amazon right now and get fucking charcoal toothpaste, tube socks and a box of condoms and it'll be there t tomorrow. So people value scarcity. Uh, you know, so I created scarcity. I, I did the same thing with, with this next hum with the hummingbird shit, like a limited edition vinyl. Like you just have to come up with different ways to sell the same fucking thing. That's interesting. Uh, man. I, I, I've you know what? That's the, I've, you know, I've marketed and sold a shit ton of books myself. That is, uh, that's brilliant, man. Did you, did you just discover that, or did you see somebody else? How that you just literally just figured it out, or? or yeah, that's look, man. Like I think, I think, look, I'm, I'm not educated, but I know I'm intelligent. You know what I mean? And I think part part of being intelligent is being able to learn on the fly, adjust, pivot, be flexible, and see what works, and do more of that. See what doesn't work, go away from that. For instance. Yo, dude, I'm doing the fucking, I'm, I, I call it the Trump technique for my book tour. I went to goddamn, uh, I went to fucking, uh, New York to do a book signing. Biggest city, biggest city in America. Over 10 million people or whatever, you know, 30 motherfuckers showed up. Right. Of those 30 motherfuckers, 12 of them had already bought the book already. So I, what, what I, you know, and maybe I talked to more people into buying more books, I, I sell a total of fucking maybe 50 books in New York City. And uh, I had a weekend down, and I'm like, hey, let me go do something somewhere on, up the coast. I'm out here in L.A. So give me, give me a – and my publisher's like, yo, you know, you're getting a lot of people in, like, fucking Stockton and shit behind your book. So I'm like, well, give me a fucking working class city. So she got me Bakersfield. Bro. I had over, I had over twice the people show up from Bakersfield to fucking New York. Right. So like this is a new technique I'm gonna I'm gonna adopt. One, those people were way more grateful for me to come out because no one comes to see them. They're forgotten. Two, it is the market that I'm writing about. It's your demographic. These are the people I. Yeah, these are the I like quit trying to be accepted by people that don't want you and sell to people that you're writing about anyway. So like this, the, like and I, I had to get clubbed in the head with that because I wanted so bad to be accepted by the literary world, but it's like you know what? Fuck them. Right. They don't want me. Quit trying. Quit being desperate trying to get these motherfuckers on your side 
you got all these untapped markets. Bro, I'm going to go to fucking Mississippi. I'm going to go to Little Rock. I'm going to go I'm going to go to these working class towns and I and you know, sell 50 books at a time, 60 books at a time and build it that way. And and if if the other people catch on, they catch on. But it's just about like seeing what works and adopting it. It's so it, it, or looking at other like Yo, I just told, I ripped off the fucking Supreme model, dude. I ripped off the fucking sneaker model. People buy the same pair of dunks 50 fucking times or Air Force Ones 50 times. It's like, yo, why, why can't we do that with books? I mean, I, I mean, I like what you said. I mean, I, I it's the mantra that I follow. Success can be duplicated, right? I think a lot of people think that, you know, it's like knocking people off or whatever. And in fact, I was just listening to Stern this morning. He had Rosie O'Donnell on, and he, he was talking about Ellen, right? She was talking about Ellen, and she says, "Look, he said he said uh, Ellen is essentially just the reincarnation of your of your show." And she said, "Yeah, of course it is." She's like, "Not only it it, it, it she said it is." You know, we're the essentially the same person, right? She has the same staff, the same time, the same format. Everything's the same. It's just a, it's just her kind of her Ellen's twist on it, right? It's it's your twist on uh, on the model. And I think a lot of people want to, you know, I've heard the, the the classic saying, "Pioneering doesn't pay." But if you look at successful people throughout the history of the world, right, they're always just making something that already worked really their own, and then maybe even making a little bit better. And I think that's brilliant. You know, you know what you're saying yeah. is like. Yeah, the sneaker you mall. At, you look at fr- yeah, friends through the MySpace, the fucking Facebook. It's all the same fucking deal. You know, it's right. all the same deal. But one guy was able to hit really big with it. You know, it, it, it's just you, you adjust. You adjust. You adapt. Uh, I th- and, and I think that's that's the that's the song as old as time, you sure. know? Like, well, you know, someone invented their wheel, so no one else was like, you know what, I'm going to come up with something better than the wheel. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the octagon. Fuck right. that. You know, like, yo, fucking that's, that's, that's the standard. People are just fucking making it better. Wheel. That's it. You know what I mean? Just the, Yeah, you, I, j- yeah. I learned that, yeah, I learned like that kind it, of the hard way too, man. I was at a, um, you know, hanging out with all these, I was literally in a room with like billionaires and all these other authors and, and this one guy got up on stage and he sold like, I want to say he sold like 8 million books. Um, and, uh, he gets up and he says something real profound. He says, there is no, there is nothing new in the world of success since the beginning of time. And it kind of like everyone's like looking around like, what do you mean? He's like, there's not, there's no, there's no new pill. There's no new method. There's no, there's not even any new technology that's going to change or, or, or make you successful. And I was like, what the fuck is he talking about? And he's like, look, and it's kind of like what you said earlier. You just got to do it. You just got to go out there and work. You know what I mean? Like it's the grind. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's nothing. The only way to be successful that I've figured out, at least now in, in life, is to actually go out and do what you say you're going to do, and uh, and then just following up, man, and just doing what you're doing. I think. Uh, yeah. I, th- I think. Well, it, look, man, I've got to. The, here's the other. Here's the flip side. I've. I haven't always been like this. You know, I've. I had. A, there was a mentality. Uh. And this is not to knock all the broke people or no shit like that, but there was like this fucking, you know, victim mentality that there might even be truth to it, but it's not going to pay your rent, you know, like it's not going to get you out of things. And I remember in back in Michigan, the liquor stores are owned by Chaldeans. Chaldeans are these Christian Iraqis. So talk about fucking minority. You know what I mean? These guys were getting shit on in fucking Iraq. They come over here. They post up in the hood, they open up stores, and they they started doing really well for themselves. They're, they're a few generations in, and they're fucking rich as fuck now, and putting each other on. And I, we would, we in the neighborhood, we resented them. We're like, look at these motherfuckers. They get taxed. That we got, we we came up with this. I don't even know if it's true or not. They man, they give an immigrant tax break. Stuff about blah blah blah. blah. Right. Mad about. Oh man, he's trying to keep my change. But like. No one's looking at that, that this store is open 365 days a year. No one's no one's looking at this dude is you're seeing the same two or three guys behind the fucking counter every goddamn day. They probably sleep there half the fucking time. No one's looking at that shit. No one's looking at their fucking at the hard work and the fucking sacrifice that these dudes put in. And when I got older and more mature, that's when I was, I was like, "Oh, like they outworked us. They out hustled us and they fucking sacrificed more than us and they and they did better than us. 
And I was just, that's kind of the model that I take now. Like, that's, yo, that's the model that I take. You know? uh, dude, I mean, I, it's like that, you, you know, again, I I grew up in Project State Housing, Section 8, you know, the whole thing. Uh, uh, yeah, and, yeah, same. And it's, and it's, you're right. I mean, you know, at some point, I have reali- I realized at a very young age, um, fortunately, right, that at some point, you know, you, you have to take responsibility for where you're at in life. You can't fucking blame others. You can't blame your mother, your father, the project, society, whatever it is. You can continue to do that throughout your life, uh, and you're never going to get anywhere. At some point, you have to say, okay, all right, th- these are the cards that have been dealt, that I've been dealt, and now I'm going to do something about it, right? And that and, and that's kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier. Like, there's no, there's no secret, right? If you blame everybody else, I mean, it's so, it's right, how easy, I mean, how easy is it to blame everybody else? Uh, you know, and we all do it. I still do it to this day. Like, oh, fuck, man. Like, so-and-so did this wrong or whatever. And I catch myself like, all right, well, you know, how can I prevent that from happening next time? But, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's that, that mentality you're talking, that's a real thing. And the, pr- the problem is, is that I think so many people in those environments, they're not, they're not given an opportunity to maybe see other things. Like you, when you talked about in, in Hyena, you know, one, you, it was, which is amazing. Your parents gave you culture, which I think is a huge thing, even though you grew up with nothing and grew up in a difficult situation. The other part is you said is, you know, the school system that you were actually in was a decent school system. So it was a great school system. Yeah. It was fucking awesome. So you get, you see the blueprint. Yeah. So, so you're able to see other things, right? You're able to see other, whereas, whereas then you have these other kids that grow up in, you know, completely impoverished and they're and they're in school systems where nobody cares and then just and then then the cycle just continues to perpetuate and just gets worse and worse. So it, it's a you know, somewhat uh serendipitous to think like, all right, well, you know, yeah, I grew up with nothing, but man, I'm so glad that my mom would take me to that free day at the museum or that, you know, I even though I didn't fucking pay attention, I just like I was just like you, man, in school, I did have a decent school system that cared and and you know and i you know kind of could see what other people were doing i mean and it's um it's a it's a it was, it's a real benefit you know but a lot of people don't have that man yeah and here's the deal like yeah it sucks um but if if you're waiting for someone to fix that for you, you you're gonna be waiting a long ass time so it's like you, you better figure it out like that's it like you just we have no choice like it's some people have more options than others. That's it. Some people just have more options than others. Some people have a, a, a net. If they fall, they will be caught. I don't know how many, you know, I, I don't know how many rich kids I knew that their parents would drive them to go fucking pick up heroin, you know, cause they didn't want them. <laughs> they didn't want them tricking on the street. Like, uh, yeah. And other people don't have that luxury. These are all luxuries. Uh, uh but, who? Where the fuck did you hear that life was fair? Right. Like, yo, just the sperm that made you had to fucking beat out other sperm. You look outside. There's a fucking tree taking water from something else. Like this is just what one thing is going to get more sun than the other thing. Like this. Where the fuck did you fair? Get that shit out of your mind. Go get it. I you know, love it. Ain't, 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 there's no. You know who decides what's fair? Who has power? And I don't mean that in like a, like this, create, like, yo, create some leverage for yourself. You go, then you decide what's fair. You make your, makes, gets, make yourself valuable. Then you get to decide what's fair. I love it. That's love it. it. Hey, what's next for you, man? Do you, have, do you already have a third book in the works or? or... You said you wrote four. I'm like, how the fuck did he do that? Dude? Well, one was I'm a like, children's I'm book. Listening. One was a children's book. I don't, for some reason, uh, Jude, I don't see you writing a children's book, but it's possible. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be called <laughs> Quit Being a Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking boss up, toddler. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't see, I don't see, uh, I, don't, I don't see myself writing anything for the next at least year um for me to sell it uh, i'm in a totally different mind state and uh after hyena i wasn't gonna write anything and then i just had to write something because right. i was going through it and it was that cathartic experience um so yeah man like i don't know man It'll happen. I mean, my, it look my 
this, this book is successful. It's already I got passed on by Simon and Schuster, which was very upsetting to me. So I uh, you know, I've already outsold what they predicted I was going to sell in a month. Those fucking assholes. So uh, like I clearly I use anger to drive me at times. So like I'm just I'm going to sell this book for a while. I'll sell this book for a while, and if if enough people buy it, then you know who the fuck knows. They want me to get into young adult. They say YA is where it's at. I'm like, I don't know how to make shit up, but maybe. Who the fuck knows? You know, I I, I was gonna try and close this, but I but one one more thing I want to bring up what you just said, which I think is important, um, is you know how you, you said you you've used anger uh, as a way to drive you, and I think um, that's pretty powerful, man. A lot of people you know try and suppress anger. They you know they say you know don't get angry and all this. Stuff, and, and there's there are ways to channel it, and I think what you've done is what you just said is. You know, when somebody says no or when you're beat up and, and things go wrong or and, and this doesn't happen and that doesn't happen, to take that, 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 that anger and use it and channel it properly, it's, it's, it's more powerful than anything, anything I've ever seen. I mean, yeah, or like, look, when you look at Michael Jordan. Right. His fucking, his Hall of Fame speech, he was still talking shit to basketball players. Like, he'd already beat them and he was still mad at them. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really... Um, my grandmother my grandmother after she had her six kids they're catholic you know uh she you know they got out the house once she was older she she went back to college and uh then became the social worker and was a therapist and i was i was lucky to have her around and she 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 had this chart of emotions and i think content is like acceptance or content was like the highest one and uh Anger is above sadness. You know, it's slightly above sadness because uh, anger, at least, is motivational. Sadness is crippling. You know what I mean? Like that. It, it's it's and it's and it's above fear. So anger is anger isn't the best emotion, but it, at least it's a fuck. It, at least it spurs action. Right. And in this world, that is, you know, you know, action. Sometimes you got to just do. You just got to do. I love it. I love it, man. Yeah. You're right. Sometimes you just got to do. Uh, folks, listen, again, we, we've been on with, with Rude Jude. We've, it, it, this is probably the long. I could talk to you for like another hour, but I got to jump on a podcast next too. Uh, oh, again, sorry, bro. No, yeah. no, dude, are you kidding me? I, like I would go I would go like another. I would. I, it's just been awesome. Man. I love your story. Um, you know, there's so much more to it. And again, folks, if you've been listening uh, or even watching right now, because we're all, I'm also filming this right now, uh, and you'd like some more information about Rude Jude, uh, you can just go to his website, hummingbirdbook.com. Uh, you can find him on Instagram. It's uh, one more Jude. You can find him on Snapchat. It's rude underscore Jude. You can find him on Twitter. Uh, it's also rude underscore Jude. Both of his books, Hyena uh, and Hummingbird, are available on Amazon. They're they're available uh, on uh, on Barnes and Noble. I think they're available also on Books a Million. But you know, pick them up, read them. They're great books. They're raw. They're authentic. Um, it's his life. It's the things that he's gone through. And there are a lot of different, you know, gems in there, and a lot of different things that you can learn from. Uh, and I really appreciate um, his honesty. You, you can also um, hear him uh, weekdays from four to seven p.m. on the Shade Forty Five channel on Sirius XM. Uh, we didn't even talk about how we met Eminem. Maybe I'll bring him back, and we'll talk about how that whole thing happened as well. Um, Jude, dude, it's been awesome, man. I really, really appreciate you coming on. I know you're super busy. Um, and uh, you know, thanks again. Again, my name is Mike. Michael Alden, and we'll see you soon. I knew it! You got a copy, I really-